So thank you, Bruce, for being with me today. Um, I just have a few questions I'd like to ask you for our Speaking Truth to Youth project. And the first one is, what in your youth led you to become an activist? Well, I think there were two primary events. Uh, first, when I was in the fourth grade, my military family moved to South Dakota to the Black Hills, Ellsworth Air Force Base. And my stepfather was a drinker and was violent. It was a very difficult time for me. And I immersed myself in Native American uh, spirituality and culture and history, reading everything I could get my hands on. And I learned about all my relations, that everything was related. The things that swim, the things that fly, the four-leggeds, the two-leggeds, the wind, the water, the air, the mountains, the dirt, the plants, everything. And there was an energy and a life force that ran through all of that. I would lay in bed at night in tears because of my family and I would pray to the great spirit that I could be part of this, all my relations, as I was no, knew it at that moment. It wasn't until years later when I was doing this work that I discovered that really my prayer had been answered. So that was, I think, a very early fundamental thing for me. And then secondly, even though I learned those things early on, I still grew up in these military bases, you know, and went to military run schools. And so I was indoctrinated by the the whole U.S. control and domination ethic, you know, that we have today in this country. Uh, when I graduated high school, I had no prospects of going to college. I was a bad student because of my family chaos. I couldn't concentrate in school. So I joined the Air Force like my stepfather. And this was 1971 during the Vietnam War. And I was stationed at a base in California, Travis Air Force Base, that was an airlift base for the war in Vietnam. And so GIs would come to our base to get on the plane to go to Vietnam. And then when they returned, they would bring the body bags of the dead soldiers and the walking wounded. There was a big hospital on our base. And right across the street from where I worked, that was the runway. And almost on a daily basis, I would see the body bags lined up along the runway. And as it turned out, lucky for me, maybe an, again, an answer to my early prayer. On the day I checked into the barracks at the base on my first day there, they looked down this clipboard and the guy said, oh man, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. We've only got one room left. We'll get you out of there as soon as we can. Get your bags, follow me. And we walked down this long, dark hallway, last door on the left. And I, he kept apologizing. Really, we'll get you out of here as soon as possible. I thought it would be like a broom closet with a cot in or something like that. And he opened the door and we walked in and there were anti-war posters all over the wall and a blue refrigerator. And I learned that the blue refrigerator was illegal. You weren't allowed to have refrigerators and the anti-war posters were because my roommate was one of the leading organizers in the GI resistance movement. And he would have meetings in our room several nights a week. One night, anti-Vietnam War protesters, I'm sitting in the corner because just prior to coming into the military in 1968, I worked on the Nixon's campaign in Northwest Florida. They called it Lower Alabama, it was so conservative there. I did it such a good job of working on that campaign. They had a fish fry fundraiser for Nixon right before the election. So they invited me to sit at the head table with this racist, uh, fascist Senator, Senator Strom Thurmond. So, you know, those were my early roots. So in this room in the barracks then, fast forward three years later, I'm sitting there listening to these people. I'm sitting in the corner. And they're talking about the Vietnam War. And then on other nights, there were Black guys that came in with chairs and sat in a circle. And they were Black Panthers from the cities talking about racism in the military. And so again, I'm sitting in a corner. And I got the education of my life. So after about a month or so, my chair moved into their circle. My life was indeed changed for sure. I asked to be released from the military. Uh, they said, uh, well, what's your background? You come from a traditional peace church, the Quakers, the Mennonites. 
And I said, no, I grew up in a military family, you know. So uh, they told me uh, I could not be released. And I didn't know enough at that time to pursue other options, uh, other legal options. And so I did three and a half years of what I called a hard time. Because after I figured out what was really going on in Vietnam and what our country was really about, reading the Pentagon Papers that came out, uh, released by Daniel Ellsberg, told the secret government's history of how they lied and got us into the Vietnam War. I mean, I, I was so disillusioned by the time I got out that uh, my life was indeed changed. So I was going to school at the University of Florida, just ready to graduate with a major in sociology and political science when I got recruited by the United Farm Workers Union, Cesar Chavez's union, to organize fruit pickers in Florida. And so I quit college and I became an organizer. They trained me and I've been doing it ever since, uh, moving into the peace movement around 1982, uh, living in Florida at the time, discovering that the, the whole space issue was deeply connected to this idea of U.S. control and domination of the planet. So that's, uh, I would say, those two events, being at, in South Dakota as a young boy and then being at this base when I was uh, in the Air Force in 1971. Given the times we're in right now, what continues to give you hope or courage? Well, hope is hard to come by these days. <laughs> A lot of people ask me about it. I just did a speaking tour um, in March, end of February, early March, in South Korea, 10 cities across 10 days, talking about space because the U.S. is dragging South Korean government into the whole Star Wars program, as we call it. When I got home, somebody asked me about what gives you hope. And I said, everywhere I go, everywhere I've traveled in all these years, and I've traveled all over the world, speaking in so many places and around this country too, I always find special people. I tell people that age is not a ticket out of the struggle. Whether you're young or whether you're old, it doesn't matter that if your heart is alive and you are moved by the suffering of people and, and the planet, then you, you must be engaged. And the, the thing where I find my hope is these wonderful people that I've met around the world, that no matter the obstacle, no matter the difficulty, they continue to press on year after year. And I just say to myself, how can I not continue? You know, I really just wanted to be a baseball coach. One time years ago uh, in Florida, when I lived there before moving to Maine, I was sitting on a stoop one day, a little bit depressed about it all. And just saying to myself, you know, I just wanted to be a baseball coach. You know, how could I walk away from this enormous suffering and challenge that is before us? And, and so it keeps me moving. So what advice do you have for young people? Well, I think the thing that worked for me was trust my heart, uh, follow my heart. You know, I think study and electionalism is important. You know, it's important. I re I'm a voracious reader. I, I read all day long media from all over the world. I learned in my first year in college in a introduction to uh, English class that it's important to read diverse sources because you learn different things from different sources. And these days, for me, that means from different countries, read sources from different countries. So I, I uh, read media from all over the world, and that gives me a really wider perspective. So that's, uh, I think, really important. And then also to let your heart guide you, to trust your heart and let it inform you because your heart and your soul know the things that are important to you, the things that you've experienced in your life, the, the things that uh, are most meaningful to you. And they will lead you if you listen to them, you know, to your heart and your soul, uh, that you will be led in the right direction the right path. And so I truly believe in that. I've seen it so, work so many times in my life and in the lives of other people. So I, I follow that uh, 100%. Thank you so much. Great to see you.